Yo, yo, yo. What up? It's Wednesday night. We 12 volt talking. Yo, 12 volt listening? Nah, they ain't listening. Well, we, we, we can't really you know get like a response other than typing in the chat room, and that happens about 20 or 30 seconds after I stop. <laughs> we need to put a live link up there, just have random people join. No telling what we'd get. True that. <laughs> oh, man. So, what is going on, Mr. Vega? Nothing much, man. Getting ready to talk about some test bench stuff. Stuff I'm working on right now. What about you? Yeah, I'm excited about uh, working on a new test bench here coming up in the near future. I've been putting it off. You know how you don't ever do that, Rob, do you? You don't ever put stuff off? No, I, I no. certainly didn't put mine off for the past you know, three or four months or something like that. Yeah, we, we always are on the ball and do everything like, you know, don't have old cars that just sit around and. We don't do stuff like that. No, for sure. Or so, something has something has happened. We're backwards. Is it? Are we on the upside down? Yeah, we're in the upside down. Uh oh. I don't see the little uh, snowflakes falling. That I must. Well, I don't know what's going on. Sean K, what's going on, man? Are you? Are you got? You got noise for me? Nope, we're good. Oh, hey, Sean. Appreciate it, brother. Um. Yeah, we the reason I asked that because Rob and I were doing testing earlier and he got some noise from my audio. So hopefully it doesn't happen during tonight's show because we only want you guys to hear the intelligent talk of Rob and I. Well, the intelligent talk of Rob, the talk of <laughs> yeah, me. Let's see about that. I'm going to turn the gain up a little bit, but last time y'all had me peeking out like crazy. I had to pipe mm-hmm. it. Type it down in, in audacity. I don't, I don't like to clip. He's he's straight clipping. You could you could use the new one, SKR8 clipping, right? That one's not being used. Scrape. Scrape clipping. <laughs> All right, is that better? Although I don't I don't, I'm just gonna say I don't trust you guys in the chat. Cause I don't know what, what your setup is that you're listening to these. I'm just putting it out there. Uh, yeah, they're probably listening on <laughs> something that's connected to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Not real sure what that would be. Well, I'm going to have to make an admission before we get too far in this uh, episode that we haven't even started yet. I was hoping to have some pictures and show you guys some nice stuff about my test bench. And um, I'm not going to have a whole lot here to show you. I do have some things, but I just don't expect a lot of photos, unfortunately, for me. I will have some to talk about, but time got away. You know, life and work and everything gets in the way, and you don't always have the time that you want to do the things you want to do. Right, Rob? Yeah, I never have the time that I to do what I want to do. Yeah, so we're going to do the best of what we got. Yes, sir. I'm trying not to hear all that noise of the door slamming. If someone comes in to steal you, I'm witness. I'll call the police. They're killing me. (laughs) Slamming doors. All right. So we're on episode 62. We're ready to get this party started. Yep. Is it me or you? Uh, I think it might be me. Okay. I think it might be me. This is episode right. 62. I'll mute. Five, four, three, two. Welcome to 12 Volt Talk, episode 62. It's me, your boy, Hi Fi Vega. We're going to talk about test benches today. What we think about them, our test benches, what we want to do in the future. And I'm joined, as always, by the man, the myth, the legend, the best homie anybody could ever ask for. Big D, Willie. What's going Clinton. on? What's going on? I got my little uh, BMX bike right here for you guys. Ride a wheelie across the screen. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> In the house. What's going on, guys? WillisonAudio.com will forward you to my YouTube channel. Check me out there. 
Uh, fun as always to be here on a Wednesday evening. Those who are joining us live, youtube.com slash 12 e talk, or if you're listening on the podcast, thanks for joining us for the audio segment. Please try to join us for the video segment if you can, because you can see our beautiful faces and pictures we share and the stories we tell, and you get some more context and you see cool shirts like I am old school and high five Vega t shirts. Yeah, sure. So you can go buy some after the show. Show your boys some support. Yeah. Show See, it. I can't I can't say that oh, though, can I? I'm riding the Adidas. I don't got the I don't got the hi fi on today. It's yeah, like, I think one of the comments a couple weeks ago from one of the shows is that we were begging too much for subscribers and for money. Yeah. I don't think we beg. No. Maybe. We, pimp. we pimping. We're pimping. That's right. <laughs> this is we doing this for free, people. <laughs> so no, nah, but we seriously we appreciate y'all coming to join us as always here Wednesday night. So tonight we're going to talk about test benches. What you know about test benches, Rob? I know a little bit, not as much as I need to. Uh, maybe not as much as I want to. But what have you been using? Let Let's talk about what. Let's talk about the bench itself. Let's start from. The actual bench. What are you using? What have you used? What's going on over there in uh, Wilston Audio Labs? It's funny you mentioned that because uh, I've used really not many <laughs> since I started. I always have big plans of changing things, but in the in the very beginning, Rob knows when I got. I'm trying to find. Let me find a picture of it real quick, and I think it may be a video that I can share for you guys. Um. Let's see here. Give me a second. Oh. Oh. Oh no. Failing. Oh, oh no. I'm failing. It's not why is oh, it not showing? Oh. Can you hear those dogs going nuts over there? I'm about to go out there and kill some dogs, y'all. All right, forget it. Anyway, so what I was gonna show you was the 250 amp power supply, adjustable power supply that I got many, many, many years ago. And those who've been watching my videos for years may remember that I used to have it set up between my washer and my dryer because <laughs> it actually fit perfect between the washer and the dryer. And either the washer or the dryer was a perfect surface for putting amplifiers. And then I would put magazines behind it. So it looked like people never knew that I was really using. Well, maybe they did. But anyway, you didn't really know because I had a cool backdrop. Uh, but then I could unplug the 220 of the dryer and plug in this huge power supply. So it worked out well. So that was my first kind of test bench. So it was the dryer. That that was the beginning. The dryer was the test bench. Yeah, boy. And the dryer outlet was the uh, power was the power source for the big power supply. But um, so after that, I, I found a, it's funny. I actually went to a, a state surplus and bought a table for like five bucks that was used in some state facility. And um, that was my test bench for a while. I got a couple 20 amp circuits put in. You guys may remember the Audio Authority 100 amp power supplies. I got two of those. I had them stacked on top of each other. They were 13.8 volts, non-adjustable. Use those for a while, but I found that they sag voltage pretty bad when you put a real load on them. So, uh, then when I moved, I started getting into the batteries. Oh, congratulations, David. Wow. Oh boy. 12 volt life talk, baby. Life changing event. If you're looking for a name, uh, Robert or Derek are fine names for a young man. Just not baldy. Yeah. <laughs> or a big dummy. So, uh, so yeah, that's awesome, David. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, best of luck to you. Um, and yeah, you won't be able to buy any audio for a while because you'll be buying diapers. So send your donations to David instead of us. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the $5 test bench, I set it up and I got two of the outlets put in. I used those power supplies for a while. And then I moved and I do have a picture of this setup and... You guys, uh, I think you have seen this. Here we go. And I'll try to zoom in a little bit. I'm not sure why it's not filling up the screen. Oh, yeah, that's back in the picnic days, man. 
I remember that. Yeah, the picnic, the picnic table. So uh, I think this is probably the same table that I bought. I just put a, a picnic <laughs> blanket thing over it. <laughs> and uh, this is when I first got the Amp Dino. So this was back in, I think it was 2012. It's been about seven years. So I think it was 2012. And you can see one of the first amps I wanted to test was the, the Rock for Power 1000. But um, yeah, this was actually in our rental house while we were getting our house built. So I used this for a little while and I was still using that big adjustable variable power supply. And uh, let's see if I've got another picture. <laughs> um, and as Rob knows, when it gets really cold in the winter, uh, my area that I use for testing, I've got an air conditioner out there, but I don't have a heater. And if it gets really cold, then I bring the stuff inside and, and I try, try to test home amps like I did here. These are the two plate amps, the one from Young and the one from Dayton Audio. And I just hooked everything up right here. And all you got to do is, is plug in the power supply to the amp dyno because both of these amps actually just use wall power. So you can test things like that inside. But uh, yeah, there's all kind of different ways that, that Rob and I do this. And, you know, um, it's nice to have a really nice test bench like, what Mark has at Car Audio Fabrication. I think that's kind of what Rob and I uh, reach for, or either the one at Kicker that, that they showed off. Did you see that one in Dean's latest video? Yeah, man, they're balling over there. Even sun, Have you seen Sundowns? They got a nice Sundown setup. Sundown has got a really nice bench. Now, <laughs> so if you guys know Harbor Freight, you know that they have this like basic workbench. I think it's four feet long, 14 inches. And it's got a pegboard back and it's got a shelf on the top and they put it on sale usually for like 89 bucks or 99 bucks. I think it's normally like a 149. Yeah. I bought that when I was living in my rental place and used that. And I said, this is my tempor temporary test bench. You know, I'm still using, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say it, but Man, I'm I think still that using thing's that awesome test though. There ain't it, nothing wrong with it. It could be a little bit bigger, but for what you're using it for, I think it. I think it's great. It needs to be wider, and anyway, two of them. Two of them, but yeah, I've got yeah. windows that kind of are in the way. You've seen my setup, yeah. So I've got to build something custom. What about what about you, Rob? I know you got some pictures to show of yours. You've got like a mobile test bench and all kind of cool stuff. Yeah. So we we started and have been on this one for a while. I kind of let this play and and talk about it some. Um, so basically I took the little Harbor Freight cart. It's kind of like a little snap on three tiered cart. I put in a CD player. I put in a voltmeter and I put in speakers in case I wanted to test an amp for functionality more than just dyno. And originally I used some of the back caps in there, but, um, yeah, I had my load set up that I'm pointing at there. I had those hooked up just to some, um, some little push pin terminal type type setup. But that was that was my basic setup at first. Did and, you say back caps? Hold on. Did oh you say yeah. Back caps? I did say back caps. I meant to say boost cap. Boost cap. Okay. Just yeah. making sure. Sorry, let me interrupt. Now, Go ahead. Now that that's a that's real old school right there. The back caps. I should like if I had about six of those back caps, man. Woo. We could test some big stuff. But uh but yeah that in my particular setup and this is kind of going into, you know, mobile versus stationary. For me, I have like one room or a garage that I have to do everything in. So I need it to be mobile. And once I, I'm work, I've worked on my new test bench. I've got my new test bench set up and there will be a video of it Monday. So you guys can check it all out. But uh, it's mobile as well. It's just upgraded from what I had before. And this cart has actually served me very well. And I've done a lot of a lot of tests on this and you know there was flaws in it as in it being so mobile every time i touched a button to unpause it you could see in my video it shake you know just shake a little bit back and forth and so i'm hoping that the new one won't do that and i'm going to try to find a way that it won't do that but yeah basically that that the new one i will go ahead and it's like a if you're on my patreon you've already seen it but I think I might have showed it off in a video before too on my channel. It's a husky. It's like a single drawer, two door bench. It's got a pegboard on the back. It's about 30 inches wide. 
it, it's got the rolling caster so it's good it's a real nice setup i can't wait to show you guys off uh show you it monday sweet i like the way you have the speakers built in that's something i haven't really incorporated in mine i have like little bookshelf speakers sitting on the top of mine and i don't have my head unit built in <laughs> i'm so embarrassed to say i'm using like a little marine external box a little plastic box with a little flip lid uh, for my alpine and i've just done it and it's one of those things that i always wanted to mount it permanently and do it differently but it um yeah it just you know it's like do i want to make a video or do i want to spend time working on the test bench and it's usually option a instead of option b but yeah um, and on my new bench my my deck won't be built in like this right off the back so right off the back i've got something similar to your setup going on so i'm gonna be right there with you now yeah and i think somebody let the dog out or yo kid or taco bell or something <laughs> rob's having some some doggy challenges there in the background but um yeah so um i really like rob your setup for especially for the amps you know that you test are a thousand watts and under um I actually use a rolling bench similar to what you have there for um, it's where I store the ultra caps and I'll share a picture here of mine again um, showing the ultra caps. I think you guys have seen this. If you've seen this video before, you've seen this setup where I've got these Maxwell boost caps. I think I've got like 48 of them total because they, they go in um uh batches of six and they're all in series and you can see i'm showing a picture here with one of them's kind of getting the oozy i had to send that one back but uh yeah i've got those on my rolling test bench and when rob was here before i showed him how that worked because i can roll my test bench and i could use my little 100 amp power supply or 75 amp power supply to keep these caps charged and then we used like a 4,000 watt Orion amp to almost blow those Blaupunk subs out of the box in my Ranger. Remember how they were smelling, Rob? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, did, it did pretty well for what it is. And it's nice, like Rob said, to be able to move it around. Because even when we're doing the $150 SPL challenge or doing some of the other challenges, it's much easier when I'm working. I can put the amp on the rolling test bench and just run the speaker wires into the car. And then that way, you know, you've got a mobile power setup. You know, you don't have to worry about being so far away from it or whatever. It's nice like that. Hey, you know, the good thing about the stationary, I would say, is that you're more able to set up your shot every time. And you don't have to think about where you're going to put your lighting. With the mobile, that's, you know, you're at, if you're outside it's just you're doing whatever you can but if you're inside you're kind of moving lights around when you have it stationary you know for our cases anyways we're filming you can already have your lights set up and you know what spots are going to be lit well and what what is it all right what about do you have all any right. uh you i'll, I'll any... show, show oh, something real quick <laughs> yeah go ahead you guys may not remember this and it's very funny because rob and i always talk about the you never show yourself soldering, soldering or whatever you want to call it on uh, the internet because you know the NASA engineers are watching. So this is the first bank of resistors I got for uh, my. I don't even know what I called that one. It wasn't the big dummy load. It was before that, but <laughs> I actually made the video and everything, and I decided my soldering was so bad that I never actually released it. But I use an old PC case, a full-size tower PC case, and I put a bunch of these inside. And I had all the wires coming out to the very back of the PC case, but I had it so I could jump them. And I could go anywhere from 8 ohms down to like a half a ohm. And um, these are these are wire-wound resistors, and I can't remember how much they cost each. They were like 8 or $10 a piece. But I bought a bunch of them, and that was my first... Uh, set up because you guys were, you know, maybe you know or you don't know, but when you test an amp, you do have to have a load on the amplifier. Most of the time, we use resistors. You can also use subwoofers, but you have to use a different 
uh, measuring mechanism if you use speakers because it's a reactive load ver versus being a resistive load like these. Resistive load means that it doesn't change. It doesn't vary with frequency, whereas reactive load is going to change. Uh, the impedance is going to change based on the frequency. But having something like this way back then and then having, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that I enjoyed about the dyno, which this could have been done with relays because I talked with uh, – Sean and some other people before, right? you know, well, we can set up some relays so you can push some buttons and go from eight ohms down to two ohms down to half an ohm or whatever and not have to rewire it every time. So I was excited about that. But when the dyno came out and you could just do it through the little screen, I was pretty much sold. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. That, that is, uh, that's way easier than what I do. I use the resistive loads and, you know, on my test bench now, I've got it, I've set it up in a fashion it'll be much easier to do it now but before you're basically just jumping wires so you know i got two four ohm resistors or four four ohm resistors i'm just jumping from one to the other to the other and you've got to get your probes in there somewhere and it, it can be an absolute disaster sometimes and it takes longer i mean honestly to do your test having yeah. to rewire it each time than it does you know just switching a mode on the dyno so you know, that's uh, one factor in making this more more fluid and easier is to use the dyno because it's just so much easier to change everything. But um, so you talked a little bit about your plans, Rob. Have you, have you got plans to have a um, a stationary type setup or are you still going to go with the mobile one for the next one? So I do have a mobile one for this one, but my, my goal in the future is right now my mother-in-law is living with us. So She's working on getting her own place. When she does, when I get my room back, I'm going to build something. It's going to be my streaming studio and test studio. Test studio to the right, streaming studio to the front. I'll have everything stationary. Hopefully, I'll be able to put my TV right behind me, maybe display some stuff, cool stuff. So, yeah, it's not just for uh, for test bench, but for streaming in general. That sounds cool. Let's yeah, talk about so power. Power? power power we have power we have power we have the power all right so you guys may wonder why i don't use that big power supply anymore there's a couple reasons why i don't uh one it uses up a lot of power you're plugging into 220 you know turn that thing up turn the the voltage up start pulling current everything it's like uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation when you turn on the 20,000 Italian lights. Yeah, it costs a lot more. But the other thing is the noise. Um, that uh, power supply that I use, the best way I can describe it is it sounds like a bandsaw. If you guys know what a bandsaw sounds like, it's got a loud buzz. You turn it on, it's just, it makes a lot of noise. So when, you, when I'm doing tests, most of the time I do voiceovers anyway, but there's there are some times when I'm doing extra footage that I like to be able to talk as I'm doing the filming. But with that power supply, I just couldn't do it. So that's why I decided to move to batteries. And right now I have eight excess power D1400s uh, all in parallel, and they're charged by a PSC60, the Intella supply. The Intella supply can run... Uh, it can be on or it can just charge up and then leave it off. And that's what I usually do. I charge it till the batteries reach about 15.2 volts and they, they stay there. And then I start the test and they kind of sag as I do the test. But um, I think it's nice to have, you know, in Dean's recent video where he went to kicker, they showed they had a bunch of those Astron power supplies and they had like a master switch or, or master uh, potentiometer where they could vary the gain or voltage from all the way down to like 10 volts all the way up to 14.4 or higher. And I think that's really neat to be able to do that with same way we are talking about pressing buttons to set your own load on the dyno. It will be really nice because a lot of people ask us, I know they ask you too, Rob, with the old school answer, oh, we want to see 12.5 volts. What does it do there? This 14.4 volt stuff is too high. So I, I built my setup up mainly for testing the bigger amps and knowing that some people wanted to see that. And I wanted to keep my voltage somewhere between 13 and a half and 14. 
for most of the tests. That's kind of why I decided to go with the batteries for the noise. Like I can be completely silent. And what's really interesting to those who have never tested amps is if you low down a bigger amplifier, when it's quiet in the room and you can hear the screaming and the squilching and the, squ- and the whining of that amp, it's really kind of neat to hear what's going on because otherwise you're not going to hear it with all the you know, power supplies going and the dogs barking in the background and whatever. That was a jab at you, Rob. Uh, Shot fired. Shot fired. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so that's why i decided to go with the uh, with the batteries but um i don't know what i'm gonna do moving forward i've got the lithium and we'll talk about that when we get down a little bit further but what do you think rob about using batteries versus using power supplies so to me like batteries are the future of what i want to do i'm using right now a cosell power supply that our buddy jdr was cool enough to to, to hook me up with so it's a really solid power supply. I can adjust the voltage, like you said, and it holds very strong within its rated power. And and that's good for someone that like that repairs amps. They need to know what it does at a certain voltage, and it's very precise. For us, like you said, that's not so important to us. To me, the the power or the uh, the ability to be stealth, quiet with a battery will be nice. I need to do that. You can get more capacity out of a battery for cheaper overall. Um, the only thing is, you know, batteries are consumable. So after a while, it, it's going to continue to cost you. It's not just a uh, one cost thing. So that's, that's definitely a con when it comes to battery power. But it's something that I definitely want to uh, upgrade to in the future. And that that uh, that Wolfram, their new uh, sealed 70 amp hour, it's looking pretty sexy, man. It pre-sale prices of $999. Yeah, it sounds like a lot, but you know, you compare it to some of the other things that are available and, it, and it's pretty expensive. Now, I've already got people in the chat room asking about the lithium bank. So when we had Scotty on before from Excess Power, you know, we were talking about these yen longs, 40 amp, 40 amp hour yen longs. And, you know, kind of his thoughts of them. And there's just so many advantages to using these over using the AGMs and everything else. But they're they're kind of pricey. You know, I did a video on this and called a, a, a bolt, a nut, a bolt, and a couple other things I said wrong, which I'll never live down. But I don't really care because it's to be human. Um, but anyway, this setup here, they advertise it as being capable of, 8,000 plus watts. And so I did a test and I used the MD 8,000 from tar amps and I got an extreme voltage drop. And I've been talking to Brad Mazda 2284. He does a lot. I mean, a lot of lithium battery testing and he did a similar setup and he didn't get near the voltage drop I got. So I'm pretty sure that I've got one or more bad cells in this batch here. Uh, I just have not had the time to go through and do load capacity tests on each one of the cells because it takes a while. Um, But I do have more cells. I think I'm just going to replace the whole bank and, uh, and, and cycle it a couple times and see if I can get it to work properly. And then maybe I can start narrowing it down to figure out which ones are which. But the cool thing about these is they can be recharged like 20,000 times. Their cycle life is just through the roof. Um, anyway, it's just, you know, for me, I know it's expensive to buy these. This was over $1,000 with the batteries and the um, bus bars and the balancer. But, you know, for doing the test bench and having something that's going to last, for me, I didn't think it was that bad. But one of the other things I want to say real quick is, you know, I use the PSC60 Intelli supply from Excess Power, but Massive Audio has an adjustable power supply that's 100 amps, and you can parallel up to four of them together to give you 400 amps. And that thing is adjustable from 10 volts up to 16 volts. So I'm looking at maybe possibly getting a couple of those. And Ryan over at Budget Gym and Budget Bus actually use those, and he says they're not that loud they were actually pretty quiet and he uses those kind of like his alternator because he uses batteries too but he uses that to keep everything charged and that 
that's a good option too for a test bench if you have the lithiums or have the AGMs, you know, as your main power source, and then have something like those power supplies that are keeping the uh, the batteries or whatever charged up. And the massive audio is designed to work with batteries. I know some of them they say you're not supposed to use with batteries because of the feedback and all that, but they do. And so that's kind of what I'm looking at doing for moving forward. Um, yeah. So what do you think, Rob? Yeah, I, I'm definitely batteries all the way. That that's what I want to do as my main. I also, obviously the Cosells, it's here to stay, and it's always going to be there because when do you not need 130 amp power supply? I mean, it's just useful. But uh, yeah, I want to do batteries. You know, speaking of batteries, what about you? Just talked a little bit about your boost cats. What, what do you think about using those? I mean, you use them for a little while. What are the kind of the pros and cons of those? What what did and didn't you like about them? Um, yeah, that's. I mean, th the one thing I don't like about the ones that I have is I bought the black ones, which are the two point five volt, twenty five hundred or twenty six hundred amp hour. Uh, those in a bank of six are only designed to be charged around fifteen volts and not over. So, when you go to fifteen volts it's really difficult for one without using something like that massive audio power supply that I was just talking about. That's adjustable. It's difficult to find something that charges to 15, usually charges to 14.4 or charges to 13.8 or something like that. And then by the time you let the voltage drop, it's going to get lower than what you want. So the reason I kind of moved away from them is because with the AGMs, the 14 volt AGMs, my starting voltage could be a little bit higher around 15 and a half. And then once even with the bigger amps, once it dropped down, and even on a 5,000 watt amp, it would still be around 14 volts or a little bit under. So that's the main reason I moved over. But I mean, the caps with 48 of them, like I've got, it's got quite a bit of capacity. But I mean, I spent quite a bit. If you add up what all those capacitors cost, you know, I probably could have done a real sick lithium bank. But <laughs> the lithium, the LTOs weren't really a, around five years ago when I did the caps. So but I think they work, they still work really well. I mean, like I said, you, you saw me use them when you were here. I think they still work fine and they still would work fine. You just have to know how many that you need. If you're going to use those on a test bench, they're designed for the really quick, really fast boost of power. They're not really designed to play, you know, for a longer time, but most of the tests we do are pretty quick. So I guess it just depends on how you need to use them. Yeah, and I think that's maybe a bonus for the power supply. So if you're within like 60 to 70% capacity on the Cosell, you will stay solid at 14.4. Whatever you set it at, it'll be solid. Up to, you know, 60 70%. Sometimes you do a little better depending on the efficiency of the amp. But um, that's nice, not having to worry about the sag until you start. Once you get into the 80, 85, 90%, you're starting to get some sag on, on the uh, power supply itself. But up until that point, you can stay pretty consistently at 14.4. And that is something that I do like about the stationary versus batteries or caps or, or whatever, you know, if you're rocking all the back caps like I was talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because, you know, people will complain that test bench uh, tests are not real world. You know, there's this back and forth of, oh, it's not the same. We won't do that in a car. You know, the purpose of testing an amplifier on a test bench is not to simulate what it does in a car. It's to find out. Oh, excuse me. It's oh, to find out. Yawns. No, that was a burp, but sorry. <laughs> uh, it was to, it's to find out the, uh, you know, the, the, the output of that specific amp in the best conditions. And when you put it into a car and you're testing with speakers, there's so many different variables that make it. So if you did it that way, then I'm not going to be able to show you the true capability of that amplifier when I do it in a car and using speakers. Whereas on a test bench, I feed it enough voltage, you know, make sure I got the current I need. Then you can say, hey, this amp does this rated power. It doesn't do its rated power. So that's kind of why I go the way that I go with that. But I did think that, you know, showing a little bit of voltage drop is not a bad thing. I don't think because it makes it more realistic, but you know, cause people aren't going to keep these high voltages. Um, I don't think unless you've got 
either one or more big, you know, 370s or whatever, those real big alternators. Um, but they're also not going to be using test tone. So it's going to be the power that they see, uh, the amps that we test is going to be a momentary thing. It's not going to be a continuous uh, type deal. So I think your iPhone's set up. I think it is too. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, but I definitely hear you on on that. You know, it's you know, it's kind of at least when you're testing, everybody knows when Big D tests an app, this is what's going to happen, and they're all on that level playing field. You know, that varies from tester to tester, but you know, you got some sort of baseline. You know, talking about measuring devices, you want to get into that, or or you want to you got you want to finish up on on power. You said uh, you said baseline. I just had to um, appreciate that real quick. No, we go ahead, man. We can talk about whatever you want to. I'm just here for the uh, for the for popcorn the and the for popcorn the dad and jokes. The that I, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, we we can briefly touch on this because we have touched on it before, but I mean many times. Amp Dino versus AMM One versus Term Lab versus the O Scope versus clamping power. You want to you want to give us the little wow. the elevator pitch on that? I'll try my best. Um, there's benefits to each one. Start off with the handheld AMM one. Hand, handheld AMM ones are back in stock, by the way. Now, finally, uh, those are probably one of the most useful utility tools you can get for testing amps because you can test using resistors. You can test using speakers. It helps you find your resonant frequency. Uh, it tests all kinds of stuff, live power, dyno power. It does a lot of different things. So for something you need that's portable that you can share with your friends, like we've talked about before, buy one of these and between two or three friends, cause they're kind of expensive, like 400 bucks. And that way you guys can share them back and forth through your car club or your, you know, whatever kind of club and that way, uh, you can kind of pass it around. That's the benefit of it. Obviously the term lab, the benefit is you can you can measure your SPL and you can also determine your amplifier's output. Uh, the drawback of both the term lab and the MM one Rob is flashing there. What is that? You got ghosts going on back there, Rob behind you. I think my battery's dying back there, man. Oh Lord. <laughs> I think they're coming to get you from Mars. Uh, nope. He dropped out. So uh, I think he's just changing his battery, but uh, anyway, the MM one, and the term lab both measure one channel. Now I think on the term lab, you can probably get two clamps and measure two channels, but by default it's one. And obviously the AMM one can only measure one channel. The amp dyno, the 81 can measure two channels. So you guys have seen my amp dyno drag races before. And it's because there's two completely separate resistor banks that when you run in a two channel mode, they run individually and you can measure wattage of two different amps at the same time which is really super cool so there's kind of advantages to each one but i would say overall if you're just going to get one and you know for the flexibility and the price the the mm1 is really the way to go yeah i mean i've said it before i think it's the best tool in audio right now it for the if you factor in everything i think it's the best all in one tool you can get even though it does cost $400, it does a lot of things. I don't even use it for everything that it does, but it's an awesome tool. But King Travis asks a very good question. A M M one or term lab. Now with the power pro kit, that's going to cost you more than the AMM one. But if I had to uh, choose, I believe I'd probably say term lab with the clamp. Yeah. I mean, it depends if you're, if you're S into SPL and you're trying to measure systems or, you know, you've got friends that are in SPL. Uh, wow. To me for life. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Wow. Awesome. Thanks for watching our show and thanks for donating. We greatly appreciate that. Um, but what I was going to say is, so with the term lab, if you, or building an SPL system and you want to know exactly what you're going to get when you go get it measured, you know, the term lab, probably no brainer. Uh, and then be able to see the power you're making as well. But if you're not into SPL, you're just kind of curious about 
how much power your head unit puts out or how much power, you know, you collect old amplifiers or something and you don't have a uh, reason to test anything really big, even though the AMM one can test things 10, 15,000 Watts or more. Um, it's just the flexibility there is pretty cool. And the other things that it does like getting resonant frequency and uh, telling you, you know, the, the live power thing is just really cool. So if you hook it up, it's got a hole in the MM1 where the speaker wire goes through. And then you have the two probes that you put on the positive and the negative channel. So when you play back a test tone, you can watch and see not only the frequency, but you'll see the ohm or the impedance of the speaker. And then you'll see the actual power uh, that the speaker is seeing from the amp. And sometimes it's really wild, especially when you're playing back with a subwoofer and you're like, man, that subwoofer is thumping. You know, the sound is just jumping. The walls are shaking and it's like 25 Watts. You're like, what? 25 Watts. What? That's some class A Watts. It's true though. I'm <laughs> telling you, man, it'll flip you out. Yeah, it, for real. It, it does it. Yeah. And you know, you'll see it. It'll, sometimes you'll see that impedance, you know, on a four ohm speaker, it'll peak up at 10 ohms where you're only doing like 80 Watts. And like you said, it, it yeah, it does. You know, just it's pounding. Pounding like the ounces. Sorry, had to do my dad joke. Um, so let's see where we're at here. The DD1 for testing, for setting up your uh, gains and, you know, uh, versus an O-scope. So, yeah, we... <sighs> We've talked about this a lot, and we get a lot of arguments from people that that um, you know, that like oscopes. Tony Demore has shown this many times with a very very expensive oscope. I mean, we're talking what four or five thousand dollar oscope that the oscope just cannot detect the uh, distortion the way that the uh, the DD one can. And, you know, obviously there may be some oscopes that can do THD, but generally speaking, that is an audio measuring device that will give you your THD, like a HP 8903 is a THD analyzer, and it'll tell you within like hundreds or thousands what your THD is. But when you're uh, just trying to use a regular oscope, and most people, go ahead and admit it, you can buy one of those little DSO nanos you know, about this big for 59 bucks off eBay and set your gains and think you got it right. Well, you may, but you can be clipping pretty hard because the screen, the resolution is so little, so little, so low, 320 by 240 maybe. And by the time you hit the point where the the rounding is squared off, then you're clipping pretty hard. So I would rather use the DD1 unless I had a really nice oscope that would measure or an audio analyzer. But are we splitting hairs, Rob? Does it really yeah, I mean, matter that much? Everything you said, the oscope people can't hear you because their pinky is so high in the air. that They're very high up there, and they cannot hear anything you're saying because it's true, man. You're using a low-resolution screen talking about, oh, you're a purist, and it's just people want to be difficult for the sake of being difficult on that. The DD1, like you said, it, it's when it's distortion, it clips light. It gives you a light. You know it's distortion. There's no question. You don't have to look at a low-res screen. You don't have to do all this stuff. It's just done. It's fast. It's easy. And if you're a professional in this business, you're probably going to use a DD1 over an O-scope most of the time. For me, testing for my time sake, using a DD1, it's quick, it's easy, it's fast. And, you know, pulling out the O-scope, it's difficult to learn how to use the O-scope. People that haven't used them at all may not realize, but it's not just turn it on and, and just start, you know, tweaking on it. It's uh, it, There's a little more uh, stuff to it. Yeah, I think um, I just lost my train of thought completely. It was something to do with the O-scope. Um, but, yeah, I just completely lost it, what I was going to say. But. It's cool, Such man. We're both life, getting friends. old. We're both we'll getting keep, old. <laughs> we'll keep moving on. So what about uh, clamping? Oh, so 
the, like a DC clamp is another tool that, that we use. We both use. Matter of fact, you gave me the DC clamp that I use and it's still kicking in, kicking in awesome, but it's a useful tool for us in testing to show people the, the amperage that's pulling because they want to know the efficiency. But in my videos, if you notice, I don't break down the efficiency for you. I want you to do that math yourself. Big D is much kinder. He went, he'd go ahead and he'll do the math for you. But I want someone to actually think about it. And I, I, you wouldn't believe how many times I see people in the comments like, what is that? You know, trying to do the math in, in, as they're writing it out. So I like that. Yeah. So there's a good point here in the, the chat room by Larry um, that talks about, you know, using a 20 amp power supply. Um, you know, he got a pretty decent output from an amplifier. So what we didn't stress earlier is when we were talking about testing and building up your test bench and all that, we're talking based on testing with test tones because test tones to an amplifier are brutal. If you're testing with music or you're just setting up a test bench just to play, you know, maybe you repair amps and you just want to play them afterwards and see how they sound, power subwoofers, all that stuff. Um, yeah, you can get by with so much smaller of a power supply to run off of music because when Rob just talked about the DC clamp, when we measure the, the current draw from the amplifiers, when we test them, that is the worst case scenario. Cause usually with a sub amp, we're testing at 40 Hertz. Well, it's a continuous 40 Hertz. When you're playing in your car, you're doing multiple frequencies and your current is going up and down and all that. And the best way to do that is to put a clamp on your amplifier while it's on your test bench and play your favorite song and crank it up. And what you'll be, what you'll find very interesting is when you think that thing is super loud, it should be pulling a lot of current is pulling 10 amps, 12 amps, you know, not, not a whole lot. So we need to stress that what we were talking about, what we were referring to earlier was really people that test using test tones. If you're playing around with music, you don't need as much reserve power or as much um, current available, uh, you know, with uh, having a big power supply or lots of batteries. A lot of people get by with one battery and like a charger. In a lot of cases, that'll be enough for, for a simple test bench. So we need to, to make sure that's clear. And I probably don't talk about that enough in my videos when I show the current pull to explain again, it's a best case scenario for the power results, but it's a worst case scenario for the current pull. And that that's important to say because people see an amp pull, you know, 350 amps, like the Orion 2500 XTR 2500. They're like, wow, I've got to have a, you know, uh, a 400 amp alternator to be able to use that amp. I'm like, do you listen to test tones? Well, no, well, then no, you don't need a 400 amp alternator. You, you know, it's not going to pull that much all the time. But again, as people that do videos and, and make tests and stuff, that that's my responsibility and Rob's responsibility to explain to people that this is not what you should expect. And uh, anyway, the little side, side jag about uh, clamps and true amperage pull, even though amperage is not a word I've been told many times, current yeah. pull. Yeah, I, I say a lot word. Of, Look in the Urban Dictionary. Amperage. We we should go in there and add it for for all cardio things that that we say that that aren't proper. We just start. Most, most things I say aren't proper, so <laughs> it's all good. What what about the digital multimeter? I know you got a boss digital multimeter. It's it's the dopest. Um, which one are you referring to? The fluke with the removable screen. Oh, no, that's actually the clamp. Oh, that's the clamp. That is the clamp, well, isn't it? Well, I mean, it, it works as a DMM, too, but yeah. Yeah, so, that's right. Uh, cr credit goes to Ryan again over at Budget Gym. He found yeah. that one. And yeah, you can remove the uh, the screen, and it actually has a magnet, which it, it sticks right to the front of the amp dyno. So you have the clamp on the wire, and then you have the little uh removable screen that's really slick i mean it was an expensive clamp meter i think it was like 350 bucks yeah. but it allowed me to use one camera instead of two because before i was having to do two oh sorry and uh sync it all up together and yeah. time is money 
Yeah, see what I what I do is I just put the clamp upside down in the frame. <laughs> yeah. So uh, do you uh, see uh, me when I watch your videos? I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> you just gotta you just gotta train your brain to see it right side up. That's all. I have an idea, Rob. Yeah. You can o you can overlay a whole nother video, like the same video twice in your timeline, and you can flip it around it and you can crop it. You can crop it. See, I'm I'm saving you, hey, man. You know what? I got the new bench set up and it's going to be different. So that problem is solved in the future. All right. So you don't have to rotate and crop. Yeah. But you know, I use my, uh, uh Craftsman, uh, multimeter. I don't see the need to uh, purchase a fluke for myself, even though we use those a lot at work and I don't know. I mean, you can calibrate, uh, any multimeter, even the cheapest ones, the free ones you get from Harbor freight. So, if you've got one so, good meter, you can make them all. So let me ask you a question. And this goes to the audience too. Why is one of the best known brands, most popular brands of test equipment called Fluke? I don't know. Is that not ironic? Isn't it ironic? <laughs> I mean, yeah. can you think of a better name than, oh, it's a Fluke. Oh, I thought it was a good one. No, it's a fluke. There, I'm sure there. If you typed it in YouTube, it'd come up. It'd come up for sure. Why? Why it is a fluke? But I'm gonna tell you something, man. Fluke, like their multimeters. You know, people swear by them, but I'm telling you, we have a lot of failures of fluke meters too. So, don't be fooled. That they're very good meters, but they do fail a lot too. So they're they're not all perfect. Yeah, there's plenty of other good brands out there too. They're not the only one for sure, but yeah. So we definitely use digital multimeters. Um, I use some of the Harbor freight ones sometimes just to show voltage because when they yeah. get it to you for free, it's cheaper than going and buying one of those little cheap voltmeters. Yep. For sure. So let's, let's switch over real quick. I know we're kind of uh, extending our time here. Uh, input sources and how much do they matter? What do you think about that? I think we cover this one pretty quick. If when you set your gains with the DD one, you can use, you know, two volts, four volts or a iPhone or whatever it may be. And it should be set up properly. It's better to use car audio. In my experience than just using like a couple RCA jacks. Although I have used some RCA jacks hooked up to an iPhone or something of that source. But for what we're doing, I think it's simpler to use a car audio head unit because it's what we're used to. But uh yeah, I think it's a little bit better. Yeah, so the best thing I can say about that is when I did um I try to whenever I decide on a source unit for my test, I try to run it through my distortion detector. I don't have that fancy HP one. I've been kind of wishing to be able to afford one of those but even the used ones are like nine eight nine hundred dollars for the ones that have been recently calibrated and i got that uh panasonic one that's got the analog meter that shows you the amps or the volts on one side and the um and the distortion on the other that's really cool because i can actually tell what's the cleanest head unit what's the cleanest source and I showed a video years ago. I can't always assume that people ever, you know, watch all my videos, but there's a real interesting one because there was a professional utility or professional handheld device that was a, um, a tone generator that was designed for testing equipment, things like that. Oh, this is a professional. And it was like 400 bucks. And I think it only did, I think it only did one kilohertz. It's just one frequency. 400 bucks professional tool. I can't remember the brand. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. But I said, let me try that and put it on the Panasonic meter and measure and see what the voltage is and see what the distortion is versus my Alpine head unit or whatever else I was using at the time. And I don't remember exactly, but I think it was around one volt of output and the distortion was like, 0.1 or 0.15 percent whereas the alpine i use has got almost five volts like 4.5 4.3 volts and then the thd is like 0.05 or something like that so 
I know we might be splitting hairs, but I thought it was very interesting that that Alpine was cleaner than that professional device. It was only designed to be a tone generator. So I, I like to use whatever the cleanest source I can. And then the Alpine and of course the Pioneer ADPRS that I measured, I did that a couple years ago. That was even cleaner than the Alpine, but it's an insignificant amount in my opinion. But the Pioneer is nice because you can plug in a hard drive and not have to use a CD like I have to use for the Alpine, which by the way, boss mode, seven years, still going. The thing was made in what, 2003, Rob? Yeah. They, it's coming they, up. It's old. Uh, I mean, it's the a Alpine the PRS. The Alpine's a 9815. I think those yeah. came out in 2003. So we're, you know, 18 years old, something like that. Yep. I'm surprised 15. the transports held up because those, those are know. notorious for going out in those, but hey. It still works, but whenever it does go out, I'll, I'll use the Pioneer because the Pioneer's a little cleaner, but yeah. yeah, I think the source is pretty important. I like to use the cleanest source possible. Um, now, I know that we both tried because in my earlier days, we use like iPods because I use a little. And I'm again, I measured this one on the THD meter. I'll try to find these videos because I thought they were pretty interesting. Of course, at the time I didn't have, but, you know, maybe a thousand subscribers or something. So not a lot of people cared about it. But I tested the little, you remember the little square uh, I iPod? I remember the video in, in in particular where you tested it. Yeah, so it I tested it with a test tone to see what the distortion was. And the voltage output was like 0.7 volts. It's not even one volt. And the yeah. THD was halfway decent. But we actually use those. And did you ever use one of those in the past, Rob? You use a, like a phone or a, something other than a head, car audio head unit for testing? Yeah, there's been a few times where I've had to use an iPad or a phone for testing as well. And, uh, you know, you just, you got to set the gain a little, it's got to be higher, of course. So that higher is always worse. If you can keep the gains low, keep them low. That's right. Cause we want the cleanest. And that's the other thing too, about the Pioneer ADPRS is that it has a higher voltage, uh, output and that's got, it's cleaner. But again, for my tests, the Alpine and the Pioneer were close enough that I decided whenever I do my stationary bench that I get built in, that I'll use the Pioneer. But for now, Alpine's still working okay. So, so, so for our next one for accessories, you want to just boil it down to something you're looking for, maybe something that you want accessory wise in the future you want to change. Got anything like that, or, or are you pretty set? No, I, I want to have um I want to have the connections for the positive and the negative on the test bench. I want the test bench to be big enough where I can have those in one area and be able to run either the zero gauge or reducers or whatever straight from the distribution blocks to the amplifier. Um, right now it's kind of a, you know, we test everything that has from 12 gauge power inputs, which I'm going to show a video of that coming up here soon. Uh, tar amps, uh, base 400 up to something that has, you know, two alt or bigger inputs. So there's all kind of different, um, wiring that we have to do and having it in a convenient place where we can just jump over. I think that that'll be something I'm looking forward to. What about you? I want to get just every size reducer and have it on every bit of uh, scrap wire that I have. I'm tired of putting bare wire into a, because you know how it is. It's bare wire. You either have to cut it and do a new, new connection, or you have to try to squeeze the strands that are in there because Wire is expensive. You know, we have to reuse our wire and uh, I need a better way to keep track of my wire. That's something I'm working on on this test bench for sure. I'd like to some way to separate them. If you guys got any deals, ideas for that, uh, hit me up for sure. But yeah, I want I want to put reducers or ferrules or I want something on my wire ends. That way I can plug in and out easily. Yep. Um, I'm with you there. So uh, we'll jump straight down to things that nobody talks about. And it's just the boring stuff. Because I know when, if you guys haven't seen Dean's video, <laughs> get up your feral game. If you haven't seen Dean's video where he visited uh, Kicker, you got to go watch that. It's like an hour and 10 minutes or something. But it's very interesting to show you a lot of the stuff. And one of the things he talks about is the setup 
of the dyno. And I've done, I think the Orion XTR 2500, I took time and I showed how I did the gain overlap. I showed, actually gave samples of what the sound of the dyno track sounds like, the one for the dynamic burst and also the 40 hertz solid tone. But those type things are not interesting for people who are watching a video, but it is important to understand each time we test an amp, we're putting it through, we're setting a standard, right? We're setting the gain overlap on the dyno, making sure the gain, people say, well, what do you set the gain on on the amp? I'm like, I match it to the head unit. So I can't tell you what to set the gain on your amp because you have to match it to your head. You might only have two volt output. I've got four and a half volt. So it's going to be a different setting. Um, so you have to understand that when you see an amp dyno test, it's not just we're going out and plugging things in and five minutes later we got a video, even though it seems like that. Joaquin, you rock, by the way. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Joaquin. Uh, and I've done a live amp dyno, and you can kind of see like that that video is two hours long because I, I didn't set anything up. I set it up live. And you see what happens. I go through the test, doing this, doing that. And, you know, spoiler alert, I blew up the dang amp. So that happens a lot. That happens a lot more than you think. Or, uh, you know, and this kind of goes into the common mishaps. Like, man, you blow up a lot of amps doing amp dynos, doing test tones. All that stuff's tough. You find if we're testing old school amps, it's got a weak channel. It's uh, got some static in the RSAs. You might have to clean the gain pots out before you even start testing. So it there's a lot of setup that uh, that we don't show because it's it's not fun to watch. It's not fun to do, to be honest with you. So yeah, we here recently, especially I've I've been trying to cut down the length because you know showing the whole and I even cut out this part when I hit start because it takes like three seconds for the dyno to start counting up. So I even crop that down to make it more condensed but things like showing the setup yeah it's just it's not good for viewers they don't really care i found out people want to they want to see what something looks like they want to see the dimensions they like to know anything special about it maybe some of the connections they want to see the power but then they also want to see it power speakers you know instead of just an amp how's it power the subwoofer how's it sound maybe give you know some kind of a little explanation of that i try to do that but uh that's the things that we don't really talk about that much which we probably should more but we 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 uh talked about this a little bit earlier about you know uh, being in a garage that's not cooled or heated um i currently uh use a garage for my setup and as i already talked about in the winter time in North Carolina, you know, it still gets kind of, it gets pretty cold. I mean, we don't have consistent, like during the day below freezing temperatures usually, but we'll have several weeks where we'll be in the thirties and, you know, lower forties. And it's kind of difficult to be in an, in a garage working. Now, I've talked to Tony DeMore about it, about testing amps and the dyno, is it capable of working at lower temperatures? And he said, it's fine. Um, so I've never really worried about it all that much. I usually just warm myself up, go out there and test a few and come back in. But, um, I like Rob's idea of having a room in the house to do it. And that way you're climate controlled and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And I can deal like cold weather. I like cold weather. Cold weather doesn't bother me. I can just, you know, bundle up and, and work like that but when it's hot man in the garage i, I just cannot do it I, I sweat all day at work and it's just it's too much but i do do it sometimes sometimes you got to do it you know it's got to be done but when it's the hot days i'm usually not making videos if i'm out there building a box when it's hot i'm not taking the time to set up my tripod and get cuts and doing glue i'm just out there listening to music with the fan on and uh getting stuff done and maybe snapping a picture here or two. So when you see the things that don't have a lot of uh, extra B-roll shots, it's probably because it was hot outside. Yeah, and I want to make a quick comment because I'm seeing people in the chat room talk about the furls, the wire furls. Uh, I will say that if I'm going to do an install in a car, I would definitely use those. But if you're testing amplifiers on the bench and you're using and reusing wiring, 
the ferrules are not good. I, I bought some and I used them for a couple of tests. And what it does is when you put the put it into the terminal and you tighten it down, it squashes the ferrule and you pull it out. And then next time you go to use it, it won't fit back in. It's a big pain in the butt. So I stopped using them for the most part. So, um, but, but when you're doing an install on the car, obviously that's the way to go. But, but for doing the stuff like we do with the test bench, you know, it's just, yeah, it, you waste, you, I'd waste too much wire because I'd be cutting it every time. And it's just, it's, it's not worth it for me to do it that way. Yeah. And our buddy Mark has a great video on those ferrules and why he thinks they're better. And I tend to agree with them, even though I haven't used them very much. The, uh, the contact you get on the wire when it, it's like a one-time use when, when you put it in that amplifier, but it smashes it down in that bolt and it spreads the wire out evenly. And you're getting kind of a uniformed, um, contact point i would say but like you said yeah that's why i said the uh, reducers for us i think would be is a lot better reducers even if it's like a one out to one out reducer you're not having to strip wire it's cleaner it's easier yeah but on some amps it can't be done yeah that's true and unfortunately the terminals are not always the same so one out terminal <laughs> one app is not going to be the same size as the one on a different one yeah so, and, uh, we, we don't stress this probably enough, but safety, you know, if you're testing amps, especially if you're doing it in your house or whatever, make sure you've got the proper, um, there's a special kind of fire extinguishers at the Halon. Is that what it's called, Rob? There's a special type. Yeah. I know what you you're have to, talking about, but you have to look it up, make sure it's one that's designed for electronics. It'll say it on the, uh, and I'm sure somebody will make a comment here in the chat room and we'll, uh, make sure we, we state the right kind, but there are different kinds. You don't want the kind that does for kitchen fires. Cause you're not, you know, unless you're cooking grease next to your amps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some people may be props yeah, to man, you. Why not? Hey, maybe I should put a grill on the end of my test bench. Then I Dude, can that, grill I mean, my burgers and test amps. I try hey, some, a, you know, that's a new some show cheese, idea. Some chicken or some chicken or something, right? Next. I mean, why not, man? Fry up some chicken. But the problem with that would be then everybody thinks they can bring their amp over and I'll be cooking for them and testing their amps. <laughs> People would never leave. So I, I want to show you guys a, a special fire extinguisher that you may need if, if you decide you, that safety is a uh, concern. Let me see. You see that? That's the uh, Hi-Fi Vega edition there. Hi-Fi Vega fire extinguisher, our buddy El Fuego. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that was pretty good. It has a sticker on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they all have you, stickers. That's how we brand them. Do you make some uh you you make some some money off that purchase? No, but I hey, if they use if they use your link and they buy it from Amazon, you do. Yeah, there we go. Affiliate affiliate you're, you're link for the win. Point, you're point one percent or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, what do you what do you say we uh we wrap this up and go into the the after chat before you got a dip? Yeah, let's do that. So, um, did you get the did you get the super chatters? Yes, I can read All them right, off. Let's, let's do the super chatters real quick. Our dudes, Brandon, Hannah, Donnie, Tuttle. Sean King, Tamiya for Life, Rick Quadabomb, and our dude Joaquin Juarez. You guys are all the men, the people, the dudes, and or women. I we don't discriminate. We don't. We appreciate. Yeah. And we calibrate and we dominate. And when Big D jumps, he elevates. Keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> when i ride a wheelie i uh uh, uh impressate everybody who watches <laughs> i'll stop now oh man um so yeah so there we go that's it for the show for this week uh, those who are in the chat room here make sure you stick around for a little bit we will hang out with you guys if you're listening on podcast however you listen spotify google play apple podcast your podcatcher.com, whatever that you use. Um, yeah, we appreciate you guys and make sure you check us out. YouTube.com slash 12 E talk. We had two late entries. We had uh, Showtime SPL and the third uh, arrow. arrow. 
And the third era, Ed over at uh, Spartan Innovations just releases Omi. He has some available for sale. You can go check out his website, SpartanInnovations.com. We'll pick you up an Omi. Tell them 12 Volt Talk sent you and uh, support people like Brother Ed, who's trying to, uh, you know, trying to make things better in the car audio industry. We appreciate it. And Mr. Ed, the third era, we appreciate you as well. And Bass Head Go Boom. Thank you with your Hyundai Sonata Blue pretty yeah. car. And those who are watching saw it. But those who are listening, you're just having to hear us. So make sure you check us out on YouTube. We appreciate you guys every week. Join us. Make sure you stick around for the after show. Till next week, Big D, high five. We out. Deuces. Peace. Bye-bye. Willie Williston for the win. Yeah. Oh, oh, I, don't, I don't have that. I don't think I have that video I can show. I haven't gotten a good one of my wheelie on my 29 inch. Yes, oh, yeah, it is you, possible. You didn't send to, me one either. I oh, had, you did, didn't you? Yeah, I had yeah, plenty of people tell me, oh, you can't run a, you can't run a wheelie on that 29 inch. Yeah. Um, I, I do got a good story for you. Tell us. I, so I started uh, my High Five Vega channel or, or uh, Facebook separate, like Robert High Five Vega. So if you guys hadn't friend me on there, friend me on there. That's for all my audio guys, but I, I pretty much accept all friend requests on there unless it obviously seems like spam. But I think some of my guys have gotten catfish because this person had five friend mutual friends. I went ahead and accepted their friend request and it, it was a, a female. So then I get the, Hey, what's up? Oh, you know, so I reply back, Hey, what's going on with you or how are you doing today? Oh, and then it, then I could tell, like, oh man, here comes the catfishing. One one text right another. I was like, ah, she got him. I had to go in there and delete that off. But uh, be careful out there. Don't get catfished. And I'm not calling you out by name, but but she had five mutual friends, so it's all your fault that I accepted the uh, request. Yeah, I and and I don't discriminate usually with people I accept because um, I'm like Rob with my Facebook account. I usually accept anybody who requests. But if you're uh, a female and you have like a picture on it with a bikini on or something, I'm be like, yeah, yeah. no, that's not really no. who that is. So you're not getting accepted. And if you are really a female and you're really in car audio and you're really, you know, whatever, send me a message or something. If I don't accept you, cause it's not anything personal. It's just that usually, yeah, you know, that's the kind of people like Rob says, we call it fishing in the IT industry. Rob calls it uh cat fishing. So yeah. however you want to Wait, you know what? The, the the thing is, like, it wasn't a sexy picture because sexy pictures, you're gone right away. Like, if it's a sexy picture, I'm not accepting it. But it was just like a, you know, it was a nice looking uh, woman, but she was just normal, like sitting in her car or whatever. And it wasn't like a sexy picture; it was just a normal picture. She had a ball cap on, and uh, yeah, man, she got him. William Berg, thanks, dude. Thank you, brother Bill. You the man. Uh, so if you want to do PayPal, uh, Matthew, we don't have a 12 volt talk one. You can do uh, paypal.me slash high five Vega or paypal.me slash big D whiz, either one. And we'll split it. Just put in the comments that it's for 12 volt talk. And Rob and I are like uh forest and Bubba. We split everything right down the middle. Yeah. Fitty fitty. Yes, please, Ed. I want sexy pics. I've seen you've been working out. Send them now. <laughs> uh, Joaquin, sorry. What if I'm wearing a bikini? <laughs> he said sexy, Joaquin. I'm sorry. You, you know, now our video is not going to be monetized. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't tell you we didn't tell them the story rob you want to tell them real quick about what you noticed on the channel oh yeah so and this was mainly on my channel i thought it was ours but uh the 12e talk channel but i go into my channel and if you guys don't know if you don't have a youtube you can in the creator studio you can see all your in analytics and everything but i see a bunch of yellow dollar signs which mean it is limited viewing, so you're not getting monetization mainly. It needs to be green to work like that for full monetization. And I'm talking, it's like 10 or 12 
and I don't typically, you know, go in there and check all the time, but I seen it. And I, the thing that made me notice is like my monthly total is usually pretty close to the same. And I see like a $40 drop off. And, uh, I go in there and I guess YouTube's got a new policy. So I had to go in and submit every single one for manual review. As soon as I done that, I text Derek, told Derek, and then I went and looked on the 12 E talk. He looked on his and it has a big ordeal. Yeah, they, they have a new, um, well, they made a big announcement. <laughs> King Travis. <laughs> you got yeah, him. Like, We're, We're not like accepting that. your friend request, bro. That's right. <laughs> nice picture. Yeah. Um, but they they uh, they got sued. YouTube got sued uh, from was it the FTC about uh, targeting kids under the age of thirteen with ads. Oh, so um, yeah, they got like a hundred million dollar lawsuit or something. So what what YouTube is having to do is going back and they're making sure that you don't have targeted ads to kids under. 13 because there's there's some legality issue with that so um i don't know maybe rob they think people want to watch you know little kids want to watch rob's video and i know what it is it's because you're doing that ad of the pcb way yeah it might be <laughs> it might be See, man. they got targeting them kids to buy them circuit boards yeah and wanna, they're all going on their little you know a prototype uh, circuit board. -tech tablets and 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 ordering yeah. pcb way what do they Parents do? Like, those? <laughs> I don't know. They're probably, you know, designing something nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. And he must be watching a different show. <laughs> yeah, maybe we try to inspire, but I'm not sure how well we, uh, we do. Thanks for the, the kind comment. We inspire you to spend your money on stuff you probably don't need. Yep. <laughs> oh, well, man. So I was going to scroll back through and see if yeah, there's any probably. older ones that we missed. Let me see here. While we're doing that, I'll bring up the uh, Sparked so people can see the, the homie. The homies Omi. The homie Omi. Oh, is it on the page, Ed? Uh, it must not be on his page. It must be on Facebook only. Let's try it. You see he shared a picture of him crimping like 2,000 connections or something like that. He said, you know, one down or 100 down, 2,000 to go. Yeah, here it is. Here's the one you're talking about. Uh, where's my screen? It's hard to see yeah. it. Yeah, it is. This 720p isn't doing us justice. Yeah, it's not. Hopefully they'll change that. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> 280 wire ends stripped, clipped, and heat shrink. Only 25,280 to go. <laughs> Dude, oh, Ed, man. you're you you got to be killing yourself, man. He's a beast. He, you need to you need to find some high school kids or something that need uh yeah. need a little extra money after school or something. Come help you out. Yeah. Yeah, I guess what you know, Ed's gotten some products coming out. We're gonna have to get him back on so he can kind of school us a little bit. Yeah, and we also uh, we also have to get uh, Craig with his with his beast mode uh, SPL run. Oh yeah, with, the, man. with four watts. Uh, that old sand back and sucker man. <laughs> he knew it was coming. He told you it was coming. Yeah, yeah, he did. Oh man. All right, let's see what else did we miss. Oh, I apologize for yawning. Oh, I'm uh, you. Somebody asked a question about. Oh, what's wrong with tinning the wire ends with solder? Nothing. In fact, that's probably what we should do. Yeah, but I don't, you know what? I've done that. I've got some that I tend to wire on, but I don't, once you crimp it down, it compromises that. Or you're, if, if you get so much 
uh, solder in there that it won't crimp down that you're not getting as good connection what if you don't then it kind of compromises the that's the only problem i've had with it oh rick's got a new setup coming for the challenge nice Ruh-roh. i don't even know if uh what i'm gonna bring <laughs> the uh the suburbans in in a bit of disarray right now oh so has anybody bought it in a bmx cruiser since i've been showing mine off i like my bike i feel like yeah. a kid again hey you keep trying to get new ones too i do <laughs> i keep trying to sell amps so i can buy yeah bikes Tra- trade one obsession for the other yep i uh I've the only critical mass I've ever heard or messed with is a 10 inch, the shallow mount and JDR. I built a box for him for his truck and we played with it and it, it, uh, it was okay. I mean, it wasn't worth $10,000 or whatever they list them for, but yeah, it was nice. Yeah. I've had requests to do those too. And I just, uh, they're unobtainium, but I don't think yeah. there's, there's nothing, there's nothing, it's not like the Audison thesis, you know, you're not getting gold plated boards no. and all that kind of crazy stuff. So at the time it's a rebrand. Yeah. If somebody wants to buy a critical mass amp and ship it to me to test, then hit yeah. me up because that's probably one that I'll take just because of how, what, the, but I doubt if I contact a critical mass, they'd want to send me one. If they did, they send me a sandbag one. That's why I don't want to do it. Still waiting to post my entry vid. Oh, you go, boy. Oh. Oh, there you go. Matthew Massey just bought his daughter a Monster High bike, if that counts. Okay. Well, kind of. He should have got her Stranger Things bike. I'm just saying. Did, did it? Yeah. They're too high. Oh, I know. They they were cheap. I mean, they weren't cheap. I saw one. I, I had my hands on one before the show was released at Target. I'm like, Me oh, too. that's pretty cool. I left and went home, and I was like, man, I probably should have picked that thing up because yep. it was it was kind of expensive though. It was like what two twenty nine or two forty nine? I think it was one ninety nine when I seen it. Uh, it was Target. it was over two hundred when I saw it. But was it? As soon as I got home and looked, and I was like, oh crap! And then as soon as Stranger Things was released, those things were going for like four or five hundred dollars on yeah. eBay. But. I don't know. That's a lot of work though, because it's a bicycle. Because you have to ship it and all that. So I don't even know if it'd be worth it in that particular case. RVH man, we're gonna have it next year, bro. Hope she starts uh, feeling better. Yeah, for sure. Oh man, yeah, it's never. Yeah, your your life can get changed for sure when you know people people yeah. have issues and and has health problems and stuff. You definitely have to take care of that first. You know, none of us are getting any younger, so uh, it's just it's going to keep happening. But according to Eddie Fiola, our favorite, one of our favorite old school BMX freestylers, BMX is the fountain of youth. I think he's right. Skateboarding, BMX. Uh, skateboarding, you're going to fall down and bust your butt <laughs> and within five minutes and you're okay. not going to be able to walk. <laughs> Rob Deerdeck, Bicycle- he's like 50 years old, isn't he? A bicycle, you can kind of work yourself up to doing a wheelie and work yourself up to doing an endo and work yourself up doing, you know, a decade and a tail whip and all that stuff. But on a skateboard, yeah. you you fall, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> oh, man. If you got anything ever sell over, I don't have anything that big. Oh, yeah. I didn't even mention the uh, 6.5. If you guys seen the high cue versus the, uh, the uh, Sundown SA. We've got over 200 likes. It's happening. We're swapping Sweet. the boxes. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna see what it do. Sweet. I had uh, had a similar request that if I had a certain number of likes, and I told him I would put a bigger fuse in the dual amp that's in the little the prefab box, and yeah. I would run it down to half an ohm or whatever, and see if I either blow up the amp or go into protect. So I made that kind of a similar, but I definitely want to see those subs flip i still think that high q is a better sub but the not saying the sundown is bad but if i look at it i 
think that the high Q is more comparable to the two hundred dollar X series sundown. I do too. It's crazy when you look at the prices, but if you if you look at them closely, the motor and all that, I mean, it's it's in that league. So we'll we'll see we'll see what it does. And I'm surprised, man. I I expected the sundown to the sundown uh, fans to come down on me and just crush me, but. It's been actually pretty light so far, but it's only a day or so in, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's, it was a really good video. It's tough to do those sound comparison type videos, but uh, yeah, it was it was very interesting. Any kind of comparison video is tough because it takes a yeah. lot longer than you would think. At least two of them is better than than many. And I I was so time crunched on that you know I, I took an extra day to put it out and then you're like oh man when you're doing talking heads you didn't have no b-roll and i was like dude i know <laughs> i didn't get the freaking b-roll but i'll be prepared next time believe that yeah i try to remember myself but sometimes i'm watching it back i'm like i need to flip you know you need to if you if you ever watch stuff like on discovery channel yeah and for me it doesn't matter if they're they're fishing for tuna if they're panning for gold, if they're you know fishing for crab, whatever they're doing, they make it interesting because they change it up so much along the way. Yeah. And I get I get soaked into every show. And so what I'm trying to do is is mentally I'm trying to figure out why am I still interested in watching this? Why what's keeping me engaged? And that's what I'm trying to do with my own videos. And I think telling stories, um, is a good way to do it because it's what you kind of want to do P tell a story one of my favorite videos that steve me did is the one where he went to the uh, flea market remember that yeah. one, a few years ago yeah. he went and bought a couple of flea market amps he's like i'm gonna go buy them i'm gonna talk to the guys and say look i got i want 500 watt amp what do you got and then you know some of the guys were like well you need this and other ones were like you want 500 real watts or you want max yeah. watts <laughs> and anyway he, he went through all that and he bought them he brought them back and he tested them and it was just a really neat kind of story um i think it made it interesting so yeah for sure people want to hear a story and it, and if you i don't know if you guys noticed but i did change up my video like i was able to use this mic here which i didn't know until i started diving into specs that it can handle up to 148 decibels without clipping now you know with subs even low wattage you could clip but it, it did work out a lot better for me. I was surprised and shocked that, that it did, but it did work. How much well, easier or harder is it to test that <laughs> compared to amps? Yeah, I mean, uh, subs, you, if, if they don't have a box already or optimal box, you have to make the box. Uh, put it in a vehicle, test on the test bench. I'd say the subs are much more difficult to test um, and compare than the amplifiers. I mean, Rob did it because he he tested, you know, two six and a half. So he put the box in the same place. He tested with the same tracks, all that. But as far as easier, yeah, definitely testing amps is easier. Yeah. It, on like the weeks that I need a light week, I usually try to test an amp. Mm -hmm. because although the editing the editing's the same no matter what you do but the physical work of testing is is much easier testing amps but you know editing it's going to be your time no matter what oh lord going to beat the block down that's for sure yeah yep. man that Sean, I'm not driving, so <laughs> I am <laughs> flying, brother. That is too far for me. Uh, yeah, man. It, Sean's a road tripper. He don't care. He's like uh, Schultz. Yep. <laughs> Walmart XPR amps that were made in 2013. Yeah, I remember seeing a lot, and it's not just those. Like, um, what was the recent one that um, – quantum audio 4000 on it whatever i test that thing was like six or seven years old yeah yeah that was but a it, recent one wasn't but it? it was yeah but it was 99 bucks you know yeah. and it's well it's a thousand watts so still and you know you always get those amps like those budget 
uh, gyms, as, as I see Ryan just jumped in the chat, the budget gyms. But every time you get one to test one and it does well, it's like, eh, they don't make it no more. Or you definitely can't use no affiliate links for them. So. <laughs> no, my problem is I'll buy something that I want to test. And then by the time I actually get around to testing it, they'll have it discontinued. Yeah, for sure. And I'll be like, sure. oh, man, I waited too long. <laughs> Big dummy. Oh, man. When you guys, what day are we going to kicker? We're going on Monday, which would be the 20th. Is that right? Or, yeah, uh, 20th. The 21st, isn't it? 21st. Yeah. Yep. The 21st. It's sad to see. You know what? Crossfire, I think they're pretty dope now. I mean, they don't get a lot of exposure on the channels on YouTube because they're just, they're hard to get your hands on. Well, remember when uh, I, t I tested one of their products and complained about them not being available online. Yeah. And then the video did well. And then Jonathan price, our friend who doesn't do affiliate linking. So we can't get any yeah. help from him. <laughs> uh, he just takes all his money and uses it, you know, to wipe his nose and other things that he wants to do with it. But, uh, yeah, he started selling them. He's like an exclusive dealer for Crossfire online. He sells them at retail. Yep. Making a killing like a boss. <laughs> Set up an affiliate network, yeah, brother yeah. JP, and you will get even more sales. Help us we help will you. send people to you. Oh, you got to do it. It says that RVH says that not as scarce as Wolfram. You know, well, they, they do that pre-order jam. They do. They're, they're good about that, boy. They get people all hyped up and they, they buy like five of them and they sold out and then, oh, yep, pre-order the next batch. It's going up by $50. It's and I, like, had to, I had talked to, I talked to Colin a while back to, uh, to get him on and he agreed to come on, but he just kind of got busy. So. I'd like to talk to him about that, you know, the whole the whole story behind it. Yeah, well, obviously, it makes sense if you're running a business to get all the money that you need to buy the product. Mm. You buy the product, the customer has essentially given you a loan to order the equipment, and you're making your profit in that too. Yeah. Hey, if people are doing it and they got enough hype, and I mean, obviously, they, they have a, for the price, you're getting a lot of product, but if you're willing to wait, the months it takes then do it yeah and i think that you know you got to deliver on that pre-order and i think they've been doing a pretty good job of that so far so once you build up the trust you know people will put the pre-orders and all that but if you ever burn them if you burn the people and lose that trust it, it's a big thing to get back but i think that uh i think they've been doing a pretty good job of that now Yep, that is for sure. I'm going to put it on mute here for just a second. Yeah, yeah. I'll go through these comments and see what we got. Melissa says, when I started installing professionally, 19 Crossfire competed with the PPR uh, R series and whatnot. Now I put them in the SPL. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. I think that, you know, they, they kind of flowed with the market. They went to SPL versus SQ because that's where the money is made nowadays. And unless you truly want to be a niche. So let's see. What we got. Yeah. The third hour. That's, a, that's always my advice, man. I, I never pre-order anything just because I don't know, man, maybe I'm just a little jaded, but I, Oh, you know what I say? I never pre-ordered anything, but I just, I just pre-ordered this. I pre-ordered this. So don't, don't listen to what I say. Cause I don't need to take my own advice. But I pre-ordered that because I wanted it on day one. I'm a dummy. Capitalism got him again. I love capitalism. Sometimes I hate it. <laughs> oh, let's see. What else we got here? Matt Stark says the uh, Cosmo amps, uh, audio amps are beasts. I've never even heard of them. There won't be any pre-order from Wolfram anymore because JP bought all the stock. Wow. Uh, he also, what else did he buy? Oh, Hutchinson. 
he posted a big old fat check on Facebook where he sent them forty two thousand five hundred dollars or something. Oh, so he bought like ten subs. Yeah, maybe fifteen. <laughs> but <I'm... laughs> <laughs> now those those things are like freaking jewelry, man. I want one yep. so bad. Oh my goodness, RVH. Let's not. We don't mention that name in here. It's like, it's like Voldemort. <laughs> I say uh, this for pros, for, for, for pros, prosperity sake. Yeah. That's it. Oh man, talk about got him. He got him. He got him for sure. Oh, thanks, Cafe Eighty. Thank you. Appreciate. Thank you, it. sir. Well, guys, I hate to cut this off early, but I've actually got a conference call with work at 930, so I'm a couple yeah. minutes late. I've got to drop. All right, So man. thanks, as always, for hanging out with us. Uh, we will catch you guys next week, same time, same place, same bald head. Later. Peace.